one of our most basic ways of trying to find happiness is through feeding. Feeding on physical food, material food, feeding on emotional food, our relationships, the satisfaction we get out of doing something, the sense of self we build around things. We feed off this, all of these things. And we think that this makes us happy. And it's precisely the Buddha's insight that it's in feeding that we suffer, which is why. His teaching goes so much against the grain. In his analysis, he talks about the suffering of the five clingy aggregates, and each of the aggregates is an activity that's involved in feeding. There's the form of the body that needs to be fed, there's the physical food that we feed on, and there's the feeling of hunger that drives us to feed, the feeling of satisfaction that comes after we fed. The perception of what kind of hunger we have, and the perception of what kind of food would feed that hunger. All the fabrications, metal fabrications and intentions that go into trying to find food and figuring out how to fix it. And then the awareness of all these things. Those are the, the aggregates. Then we cling to them. And the clinging, of course, is another word for sustenance. We take sustenance even off this double level of feeding. The actual food we eat and then the activities that go into finding and fixing the food. And for all of us, this is one of our main sources of pleasure. So when the Buddha says it's precisely in feeding that we suffer, it's hard for us to take in his message. There are times when we can see that it's true, but there's some very deep-seated habits we have. They have to go, we have to go very much against them in order to admit that the Buddha is right. And especially when it comes to feeding, the sources of food we have, the type of feeding we like to get involved with. The mind has lots of ways of making excuses, saying it's, there's no suffering there, if it's suffering that doesn't really matter, or it's unavoidable. We have lots of ways of covering up all the suffering that goes into our need to feed. Think of hunting and gathering cultures. Most all of them will have this belief that the animal that the hunter is going out to get actually offers itself to the hunter. That's the hunter's way of justifying to himself that he's actually taking some poor little animal's life. And the animal was not there saying that, yes, I want to offer my life up to you. It was just caught in the act of trying to live, gets killed for it. And although we may not meet hunters in that way, there, there are other ways in which our need to feed does cause suffering for others, in addition to the suffering it causes ourselves. And because we have all these ways of making excuses and creating worlds around our excuses, the only way we're going to see through this is to look very carefully at where the suffering is. In some ways, this is even an antisocial activity, because a lot of human society is built around eating. And you notice, like when the monks go home, the rest of the family you're visiting is having their evening meal, and you're not having the evening meal. Part of them really resents it. Here we are trying to get out of the feeding cycle entirely. And so that way it is an antisocial activity we're involved in here. But it goes against not only our outer society, but also the inner society and all the voices in the mind that make excuses for the way we like to feed. They're going to resist. As the Buddha said, the only way you're going to get past this is to really comprehend where the stress and the suffering are. Look for it. Look for it again and again and again. 
and provide yourself with an alternative source of food so that you can see these things clearly. This is why the path is a necessary way of overcoming this. All the factors of the path, but particularly right concentration, because it gives you the sustenance, it gives you the nourishment you need to keep up this analysis, which is going against your old ways of eating and your old ways of thinking around the eating, and your old ways of justifying, making excuses for the way you feed and your attachment to the way you feed. So when the Buddha says to indulge in the pleasure of concentration, he really means it. Learn to take that as your source of food, your source of nourishment. And the more satisfaction you find in the concentration, then the easier it will be to see the ways in which your old ways of eating really are harmful. This is because you found a more harmless source of food and a more refined sense of what's stress and what's not stress. There's a lot of things we just put up with because we think that's just the way they are, the way they have to be. But when the Buddha set out the Four Noble Truths, one of the things he was saying was it doesn't have to be that way. The fact that there is the stress, the suffering, the pain, the anguish, these things have causes and the causes can be overcome. There's a way to practice so you can put an end to those causes. In the Four Noble Truths, he cites specifically the three kinds of craving. Sensual craving, craving for becoming, craving for non-becoming. And the path attacks these directly with right resolve, and the resolve to go beyond sensuality. And again, specifically in right concentration, finding that there is a way to find happiness that doesn't require sensuality. When the Buddha talks about the middle path, he's not saying it's just halfway between pleasure and pain. It's a different kind of devotion to pleasure. He says that the devotion to sensual pleasure is one extreme, and the devotion to self-torture is the other. What lies in the middle is devotion to pleasure of concentration. Because he said if you don't have that kind of pleasure, no matter how much you see the drawbacks of sensuality, you're just going to keep going back to sensuality because the mind's hungry. So right concentration is a natural outgrowth of a right resolve, the resolve to go beyond sensuality. You have to find a sense of well-being. And then when the mind is in concentration, then you can start seeing it as a state of becoming. But first you learn to use it to see all the other becomings you get involved with, all these worlds that the mind gets into, and then after all it can wake up and come out of. But all too often we leave one world simply to go into another one. What concentration gives us is a, another world to stay in so that we can see more clearly the drawbacks of the worlds that we tend to inhabit as part of our feeding process. And we get to see things so clearly that even realizing that the desire to destroy these worlds would also lead to more becoming. That was one of the Buddha's great insights. And you attain it by following the path. So this is a path of practice that shows that the suffering of life is not necessary. The pain of having a body, that's kind of a natural part of life, but the suffering around that is not necessary. This is offering a new perspective that there can be pain, but there doesn't have to be suffering. I was reading recently a piece on attacking the practice of mindfulness, in that it says that people's happiness is in their hands. And that was saying, the critic was saying that the implication there is that their unhappiness is their fault. Well, the Buddha is saying, well, yes, it is their fault, but it doesn't have to be that way, and they can learn how not to be that way. It's not that they're bad, it's just that they're ignorant. And the fact that we can find happiness within without having to change that much in terms of external circumstances, that's actually empowering. It's not making us docile little sheep that just obey the powers of the bee. 
It's actually our declaration of independence from the powers that be. That we're not going to let them be in charge of whether we're happy or not. We're going to be the ones in charge. So see the Four Noble Truths as the crowbar that will pry away our attachments to our old ways of creating worlds. The need to understand where the suffering is. It's because it's only when you see that something you're doing is creating suffering and it's not necessary that you'll be able to give it up, or even be willing to think of giving it up. But it requires that you be really honest. There are ways in which we feed that we really hold on to, and it's going to require some pretty strong medicine. They got us to be willing to, to let go. It's not just a matter of letting go of what's obviously bad. Sometimes it's the things we see as really, really good are really, really justified. Those are the things that are keeping us enslaved. So it's good to reflect on the Four Noble Truths as a, as a technique for getting you to see your own stupidity and to see that it's not necessary. And to see if the fact that the Buddha is pointing out your own stupidity is an act of kindness. It's not that you are stupid, it's just you have been stupid. But you don't have to be that way. Just as the suffering doesn't have to be there. And the reason the suffering doesn't have to be there is because you can change your ways. If you're willing to take on the Four Noble Truths and give them the priority that they deserve. <laughs>